Okay, you guys ready? Oh yeah. All right. Who read the chapter? Jessica did. You three did it. Lou, Louis, you. I did it. I mean, I, I have to give it to the reader. Good for you. So you three didn't read it. Hmm. We did not. You did not. Okay. Sure. Just FYI, OB is going to be a lot of. There's going to be a lot of questions on OB. So. What we can go over in this chapter, we will. My suggestion to you guys is, is to read everything and read your side notes. Jim, where's my light? No, it's blank. Hi, Cody. I can't talk right now because people can hear me. So I'll see you later. You want that light out a little bit? It actually it should be Does it get brighter? brighter? And with all this information, we're going to go fairly quick. So if you have any questions, we'll get with you during the break. Okay, guys, let's stick, start going. Okay. Like I said, I'm going to skip through the slides that you should probably already know, especially the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system. If you're not, make sure you go over your charts really good. The external genitalia consists of the labia, perineum, and the mons pubis. The, the vagina, that's the birth canal, and it is a smooth muscle. The ovaries and fallopian tubes um, is where everything's going to start. Your, Ovaries are responsible for producing the egg, which is the ova. The fallopian tubes are where the fertilization takes place. Now, sometimes after the sperm meets the egg, it's supposed to travel on down to the uterus. And what can happen if it doesn't make it to the uterus? Exactly. What happens? The baby will form in the fallopian, or the, yes, the fallopian tubes instead of the uterus. And the fallopian tubes can burst and it can cause, can be very life-threatening. So that's why it's important, which you'll know, we'll go over as we go on through the chapter. Um, when you do an assessment on a female um, and probably you can't put an age on it, but any female that's having any kind of abdominal pain, um, make sure you ask her questions. Um, if she doesn't feel comfortable talking to you in front of her parents because she might be afraid, take her off into another room and ask her questions that, um, ask her if there's a possibility that she could be pregnant and explain to her why it's important that she needs to know that. The uterus is a hollow organ. Um, that's and it's intended for where the baby is supposed to grow. It can stretch and grow it stretches and grows as the fetus gets larger. The cervix is a muscular ring which separates the uterus and the vaginal area. Know that the cervix needs to expand um, as labor begins. I don't know if I have a laser pointer. So here's your ovaries right here. And this is where your egg's going to be. Um, it's going to come into the fallopian tube, and that's where the sperm should meet the egg, and it should continue on to travel down here to the uterus. And that's perstalysis is what that's called when the egg is moving from the fallopian tube to the uterus. Know that word. That might be a test question. because it... We'll get to it. Okay. So sometimes the egg does not move 
down to the uterus here. So this is the fallopian tube. And just imagine the fetus as it's growing, all that pressure that's on the fallopian tube because there is a lot of nerve endings in the ovaries. So that's why it's very painful um, when it's starting to grow in the fallopian tube. <clears throat> Females will have a, a period about every 28 days. Um, the tissue and blood will line the uterine wall. So if the egg does not meet the sperm, then it extracts and that's what the period is. And have it lead from about three to five days. Uh, this is the table that you need to know. The sperm reaches the ovum. Ovum becomes the embryo. Embryo implants in uterus. The fetal stage begins at eight weeks, and that's when it's called a fetus. The pregnancy should last nine months, which equals about 40 weeks. There's three trimesters. And as we go through this, I have the page number and everything that it's on. So we're on page 1055. And during those three to five days, um, a woman can lose up to about 50 mils of blood. The placenta is, is an organ itself, and it's very vascular. So if anything happens to this placenta, um, there could be some major bleeding. So keep that in mind. And you have already had your class on shock. So you'll do the same things to treat the, the bleeding as you would a shock patient. Um, the placenta has the, all the tissues to nourish the fetus, eventually the baby. Um, it, it exchanges oxygen, nutrients, and waste products, and it's a whole separate organ. So it, the blood doesn't come straight from the mother, it's coming from the placenta. The umbilical cord, it circulates the blood, and it is expelled after the baby is delivered. The baby's all cushioned in an amniotic sac, um, which can float around, so it's very cushiony in there, so it's pretty protected. And you can see, you know, this, this one, and that's on page 1058. It shows how the baby's in there and where the placenta is that there's some changes that goes on with the female during pregnancy. Um, it will affect your cardiac system because they all have an increased volume of blood, but their red blood cells, the amount stays the same. And the red cells, what do they carry? Oxygen. Oxygen. So you usually see a pregnant woman, that's why she's sometimes short of breath because they have this extra volume of blood, but they don't have that oxygen that's on the red blood cells. And that's why their increased oxygen demand and consumption is more. The GI slows down and that's why they um, usually are nausea and vomit. Hormones are constantly changing and everything, the ligaments, um, become more elastic. Additional weight affects posture, leading back to pain and balance issues and pre-existing medical conditions, which we'll get to throughout the chapter. Supine hypotensive syndrome. Put, got to look at the, the weight of the placenta, the infant, and the amniotic fluid, which is about 20 to 24 pounds extra that they have, and it's compressing on everything, their diaphragm, um, their intestines. You learned about the inferior vena cavae. Which side is that on of the heart? On the right side. Right side. Which is why you don't want to put right Exactly, because you're not letting the blood come in, so they'll lose their cardiac output as well. So if they don't have that blood, 
they can't, the heart can't pump anything, which causes them to be dizzy and a drop in their blood pressure. How does the development of the fetus affect other body parts? Like I just said, what are they? Yeah, and your diaphragm. So when they're putting that pressure on the diaphragm, it's not able to expand or release. And the GI tracker, the bladder, they're pushing on that. So it affects pretty much everything in their core area. The first stage starts with regular contractions and ends when the cervix is fully dilated. Um, what, what, can, what does it go to? What's the final 10 centimeters? Might be a test question. I don't know if I've seen that in the book or in the chapter. It just says fully dilated in those stages. Because I know they have, they'll start um, considering it at four centimeters, but we don't. And they're saying in the book that we can't look at that. So I don't even know why it's in there. The second stage, the baby enters birth canal and is born. The third stage is the placenta. We'll get more into that. Braxton Hicks contractions, um, that's when your cervix isn't fully dilated or might not even started. And the key thing is to remember how you can determine that is they are irregular, the contractions are irregular, where if their cervix is dilated and they are in labor, your contractions should start to become regular. Lightning, um, some females feel that, they'll feel the movement of the baby high in the abdomen and turning and going down lower in the um, birthing canal. And here it says contractions of the uterus produce normal labor pains. Hmm. Characteristics of labor, labor pains, um, you need to uh, note the contraction time and how long they were, contraction intervals or frequency. And remember, this is important, when they last 30 seconds to one minute and they're two to three minutes apart, that means you're probably gonna be delivering that baby there at the house or wherever they're at. So if this is happening, don't try to put them on the cot unless they are already on the cot. Just start preparing your kit and say, we're gonna have this baby here. Breaking of the amniotic sac, it should break on its own, but sometimes it doesn't. And we'll go through that later. If it's not broken, what do we do? We're gonna tear it, cut it. You're not gonna be able to tear it. Mine. Keep your book says the ripple with your hands. You ain't gonna do it. Pretty, pretty strong so I suggest you have on yourself, because we don't have them in the kits. They don't put the scalpels in there anymore. No, but unless. So the new ones that I've sent down to her are going to have either surgical scissors or a Okay. The sur surgical scissors would be great because they have that pointed edge and you can tear into that. Hopefully your kit will look like this. If you don't, um, we'll get into that later. What The things that you need and can pull off your ambulance if you don't have your kit right in front of you and you need some stuff to, to use. You can make shift stuff. Um, big thing is the meconium. Does everybody know what that is and why it happens? I had that. You did? My second daughter. Did they have to fly her out? Was she born here? No. Uh, no, she was born in Cheyenne. They kept her in the hospital and monitored her for an extra day. She was born gotcha. in the West Coast. Yeah. Yep. Very big. So if they inhale that or take their first breath and they inhale that meconium, it's big infection, especially in their lung area. Meconium is in the fluid sac, is the, the, the mom's waist, or in the baby's waist, I mean. Um, they'll have a, a bowel movement in the, their amniotic sac, so it's dirty, it's not clear. And so when they're born, they could inhale that or aspirate, and that's not good because you have all that um, waste that's in the fluid that they just inhaled. 
and can cause big infection. So what do you do? What is the solution? They'll need to go to a higher level of care, a hospital. So they'll just have to have like a neonate uh, place in the hospital that just deals with neonates. That's where they need to be. And some hospitals aren't equipped for that. Anything after the third trimester, make sure you have them on their left side. <clears throat> because there's a vein that's on your right side of the heart. And if you have them on the right side, it can put pressure on that and they'll have a hard time of getting blood to the baby. So you put them on the opposite side of the heart? No, the, you'll put them on the left side that the heart is on. Oh. Yes. How many weeks does the third trimester? Seven. seven weeks? Yeah, or seven seven months is your third. Seven, seven yes. So three months again. Thirty-two weeks. That's what Jim said. So if it's wrong, I didn't say it. <laughs> Jim said it. Okay, so we're around page uh, 1061 now. Um, do know that the a normal head birth is called uh, cephalic presentation. That might be a test question. And the reason I say these might be a test question is because they're not on the slide. So that's why it's very important to read everything in your chapter, even your side notes. Second stage is the full dilation of the cervix. Contractions are starting to become more increasingly frequent. The labor pain is severe. Mother feels the urge to push or move bowels. And when she feels the urge to push, hopefully you're set where you need to be, whether it be at the, on scene, in the back of the ambulance, or they're at the hospital. This means the baby's coming. So it says third trimester starts at 27 weeks. You wrong, you wrong. That's why I said seven months, just seven months. <laughs> EMT will have to decide whether to transport the patient or keep her where she is and prepare to assist with delivery. Each call with um, a pregnant female is going to be different, and we'll learn that as we go on. They say, oh, is it the first baby that takes them longer? It can take up to 16 hours. No, I've seen mothers that have had their babies and they come right out. So don't let this. Um, define where you're going to deliver the baby. I just have to drive from Warren to Douglas, get in the ambulance, and then in front of O'Reilly's. Yeah, and that was her first. Um, and especially if the, the mother is on narcotics, when they're on narcotics, it causes everything to uh, vasodilate. So everything is open, wide open. So that baby can just like come out really fast. Give them some drugs. Yeah. What's that? I said, give them some drugs. Got it. No, no. <laughs> if they're on drugs. <laughs> you mean illegal drugs. Illegal yeah. drugs. Yes. Thank you, Lewis. <laughs> Good job, Lewis. <laughs> Way to keep us more. Exactly. <laughs> Help the instructor yeah. to mm -hmm. convey the information. Okay. Why is the childbirth such an exhausting ordeal for the mother? Because they're not on here. Right. <laughs> I asked my wife this question. It didn't go very well. Yes. This is why I don't know why I got Jessica on my side in here. And then I got the rest men. So I know why mine was exhausting. From the time my water broke to the time my kids came out was less than 45 minutes. I yeah. went from a four centimeters to a centimeter like that. Yes. And it hurt. It was one on top of the other. There was no break. There was no getting air. There was nothing. It hurt right. like a well, like it says in the book, the uterus through the cervix is like a bottle, like uh, a bottle, and then it has the neck on it. it. It has to dilate. And so for that to go from a four to a 10, um, it hurts. You guys. I think the what, book's description was probably the best I've ever heard. They said a, a wine bottle yeah. to a jar. A wide, wide mouth jar. Wide mouth jar. <laughs> yeah. So think of that 
end of that bottle opening go into a wide mouth jar. So I can show you guys what that probably feels like if one of you want to stand up here and I will kick you somewhere. Then you'll know. In fact, I think every mother should do that to their husband or partner that's in the delivery room with them. So we can go through this together. <laughs> the, uh, the delivery time, the closer it comes to delivery, the wider the uterus. Your, your cervix. Yeah, your cervix, you know, like the end, I'll use a wine bottle for an example. You know, the end of a wine bottle, the how small the opening is, that's your cervix before you go into labor. And before that baby is born, your cervix will become the size of a wide mouth mason jar. That's how big it dilates. closer you come to birth the bigger your cervix will get so the baby can get through that cervix down to the vaginal the birthing canal um always when somebody's having a baby you're just like i want everything to go right i want this baby to get out everything okay and we ignore that we have to take care of them and you have to consider always remember your abc's past medical history which will go on in more detail later. Ask the due date. Um, is she early? Is she past her due date? Is it her first pregnancy? And has the patient seen a doctor had prenatal care? When did labor pain start? Has the water broke or has she any bloody show? Um, there, it's in the book, but it's not on the slide um, about the mucus ring that's in there that's above the cervix so usually um, before the water breaks that might um, come out as well and that's where you get the bloody show like there might be a little bit of blood so be prepared uh, that that might be a test question because it's not on the slide examine for crowning take vital signs findings that may indicate the need for neonatal res resuscitation a mother that didn't get prenatal care, premature delivery, labor induced by trauma, and multiple births. The thing you need to um, consider with the, uh, the trauma or their history, when you're doing an assessment on a female that is pregnant, you need to ask, has anything happened prior that can cause trauma to her abdomen? Because it could take maybe out over two weeks that they start to bleed it could be like a small bleed and then now it's turned into a big bleed so if they've been in any kind of trauma it's very important to know when and what happened and did they have they been to the doctor since that happened remember when the water breaks it's not always a reliable indicator of imminent del delivery some can break um, 24 hours after they're in labor like I said, when they have that urge to push, that means to just stop what you're doing and just get ready to deliver right there. Okay, we're on page about 1065. Findings that may indicate the need of neonatal res resuscitation, like I said, history of pregnancy problems, We'll get into placenta previa and breach presentations later on in the slides. Um, labor induced by illegal narcotics and there's possibility of meconium staining in the water in their amniotic sac. How can you get necessary information from a patient who may be having uncontrolled pain from contractions? Ask the spouse or whoever's there and knows, knows the person and what's going on. EMTs do not deliver babies, mothers do. Primary role is to, to determine whether delivery will occur on scene and to assist the mother as she delivers, delivers her child. This is gonna be repetitive throughout the uh, PowerPoint. Control the scene, wear proper PPE, 
not always going to happen. Place mother on bed, floor, or ambulance stretcher. I think Jim and JJ's patient walked to the ambulance, didn't care, just dropped her pants and got on the stretcher facing the wrong way. So when they're ready, they want this baby out. So you just let them get where they need to go and just assist them and comfort them. Try to move the clothing from the vagina. She did it for them. So. <laughs> physician assistant, if she has um, her partner, husband, whatever, um, and it's okay with her, have them be behind her and they can help coach her mm -hmm. to breathe like they do if they take Lamont's classes. If possible, make environment as warm as possible. This is why I don't care to deliver another one. I've only had one and I don't like the heat on in the back. So this could be a problem. I'll drive with the air conditioner on I me. Mean, <laughs> we did have our second family in the seat. And according to the paramedic on charge, the baby was out and on the tip when they got there and she was very happy about that. And that's how she said it. Exactly. <laughs> um, Wait, she just delivered it herself? In the bathtub. With no help? Well, that's why it's just it's a natural process mothers have been doing it in the age of time so you're just there to catch the baby and dry it off if you if you see all this i wish shelly was here these things is in their kit like these sheets that are draped over the right leg the sheets that draped over the left leg we don't have this this is not what we have so um it it would be nice to have that, but if they're delivering out in the field, you don't have time to be putting all that on the leg. Well, if you have them, that's great. These are would be nice yeah. to catch everything and to keep the placenta out of all the waste that's coming out. Um, preparing the OB kit. Like I said, uh, Central Sterile used to make our kits for us for the ambulance. And then we got away from that. And then we would use the OB kits that were used for uh, delivery, which is all this nice stuff. So I'm going to just go over things that I think we need to have and we will have in our kit. The baby that I delivered, we didn't have the kit and it was Thanksgiving and I didn't have clamps. So I used the you know how you put your turkey in those bags and they have that little twine string? That's what I used to clamp the cord off because we didn't, didn't have clamps. But I had a lot of sheets. So you're going to need the bulb syringe and this is the scissors, I think, Jim requested. And they have like a the real pointed tip so you can use them to poke that amniotic sac and try to cut it. Yeah, watch out. Uh, sterile gloves, yeah, okay. Um, no, you're not gonna have time to put sterile gloves on. If you want to, you can. The, ba the mom's gonna have the baby regardless, so. And we're not sterile in the back. It looks like these are ties, but we have, has everybody seen the clamps? These are the clamps and we'll have you look at them. Um, we want four in our, kit they only put two so if you have twins that twin's not going to have any clamps so that's why we want four in each case or each kit and hopefully it'll come in a tub like this that they have because then you can put the placenta in this and put the lid on it and right on there um, you'll need some cotex or some pads these are more absorbent than you'll have an abdominal trauma pad but they're, these are more absorbent quickly. So make sure you have those in your kit. Did you? Okay, good. What's that? Four of those and two ABD. AB. And the ABD pads, the trauma pads are, are great. I mean, they're for uh, bleeding, but these have, they don't have that outer surface. They absorb quicker. 
left in the abdominal trauma pads. But once you put these up against the vagina, um, and there, you just you can take it away or just put another um, pad up against it. And then if that second pad get, is soaked, I would take them off and just um, put them to the side. And the book says to make sure that you keep them so the doctor can assess how much blood that they have lost. And we'll get go through that here pretty quick. Preparing the OB kit, off-duty delivery supplies, um, clean sheets and towels. We have towels in the ambulance. Um, heavy flat twine or new shoelaces. You might not have new shoelaces, so if they're dirty and you don't have anything else, use your dirty shoelaces. Towel or plastic bag for placenta. If you don't have this tub, you're gonna, when you get ready to deliver, you should have everything out. And this is the bag that your BVM is in. You can use this bag to put the placenta in, or you can put this baby put this plastic wrap around the baby because we don't have bubble wrap and stuff that the uh, chapter will later say. So use your stuff that you have. Not all the way over I hope y'all knew that. <laughs> well, we'll get into that. Yes, because the doctor will want to see that and examine that and make sure everything was intact. And they want everything that we use so that way they can kind of put themselves as it was on scene. <coughs> and then what, what happens after the doctor is done with? I don't know. I imagine they waste it, throw it away. But the mother wants to keep it. Oh yeah, that's right. That's not in the book, Jim. What, what is it? Shut up. They actually Please send the placenta off to the um, lab. Send it off oh, they the send lab. it off to the lab. Thank you. Good job, Shelly. You're welcome. <laughs> we, did you ask for a head covering? Yes. Your baby, usually, if you guys have seen or, or have a baby, you know they put a cap on. And um, we asked for one in the kit. They do not have one that's in central sterile. That's the kit that we have used. So, Shelly, we need a, a covering. Head covering. Okay, um, I gotta get with you guys on all of that stuff because some of that I don't do, but I can definitely figure out where we need to get it from. That would be great. All righty. And make sure you get with me and Jim because Jim can yep. get stuff <laughs> from the time you tell he him. He got me a list today, yeah. so we'll go over that list on Thursday that'd or be, on Wednesday. That'd be great. Assisting the delivery, Pos position for constant view of the vaginal opening, be prepared for the patient to experience discomfort, provide emotional care, communicate with patient through contractions, and um, help the mother throughout the delivery, say, what, tell her what you're seeing and, you know, what's going on, because she's already stressed out. So kind of keep up with her what, what you see and what's going on and everything's good. Because we're going to have to cut it. You're going to have to cut the baby from the mother, separate them. So once that's cut, you have this baby and you want to cut it off on each side. So the blood, you don't you lose a large amount of blood. So you want to tie it off. You want to tie it off. Um, or clamp it. Clamp it. Uh, there are two ends of it. Yeah, you have the you have the end from the placenta, and then you have the end that's connected to the baby, and you want to clamp in between those, and then when the umbilical cord isn't pulsed, if you don't feel a pulse anymore, then you can cut it. That means the blood you won't have a lot of blood loss. You tie it at both ends or clamp it. In. Yeah, we'll go over it here pretty quick. Okay, we should be around page two, 1068. Assisting the delivery, a normal delivery, keep someone at the mother's head, 
position the gloved hands at the vaginal opening when the baby's head starts to appear. This is my model. This isn't the actual size. I hope you men know. Jessica, you probably know it's not. So, <laughs> so this is not the actual size. When the baby starts to present itself, you'll want to put your hand probably on the, pub the pubis bone and underneath probably where the perineum is. And you'll want to hold there because you don't want that baby's head to come out too fast because then it could be more bleeding. And we'll have our hands on here pretty soon. Be careful when you do put your hands, what do we have on top? What do the babies have on top of their head? On the nail, it's called the soft spot. You don't want to put pressure on that. You can cause injury. My daughter the other day, she had like Vaseline on her head for her cradle cap. She was breathing real hard. And her butt and yes. Was like, it was so creepy. Yeah, I'd, re I'd rather have them have the hat on. I don't want to see that. <laughs> if the amniotic sac has not broken, you need to break it. It says use your finger to puncture the membrane. If you can get it with your finger, do it. If not, be prepared to use the scissors. Once the head delivers, check to see if the umbilical cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. We'll get into that further. Help deliver the shoulders. I'll have Jim. You'll have to come over here. I'll have Jim hold the baby. So as it's coming out, you guys need to pay attention because I'm going to have you guys deliver this baby pretty soon. I was just going to have you hold it, but that'll work. Is it upside down? Yeah. Okay. You're going to have to push it. So as we go through these slides, I'm going to have Jim. Push the baby through as we go through it. What did I do with me? Support the baby during the entire process. So if, if you notice through these slides, it's um, saying the same thing. So we're going to support the mother. Um, don't drop the baby. Assess the airway. Use a syringe to suction the mouth and nose if ne necessary. How do we know to, which one do you do first? Mouth. So how to remember that is in the alphabet, M comes before N. Note the exact time of birth. Um, support the infant's head. Aid in the birth of the upper shoulders. Yeah, you don't do that to her. <laughs> Mother's not going to reach down there and pull herself apart. Okay, so the baby's out, and you're checking to make sure the umbilical cord isn't there. You're supporting the head. Um, I'm checking the airway. And so you keep the baby aligned with the vaginal area. Don't tilt it up, don't tilt it down. And then you wanna support the shoulders. Need to be this way. As the baby comes out, so leave her or him at the vaginal area, check the airway, suction if you need to. Once the baby comes out, you will get through that later on. So the placenta is still in there. I'm gonna, and Jim's not pushing anymore, so I'm gonna hand, the baby to my partner and we're going to be checking to see on the placenta I don't have some clamps extra clamps they moved them okay 
So you're going to go 10, 10 inches from the cord. About right, probably about right here, right there. And you're going to put a clamp, and then you're going to go three inches below that, and you're going to put a clamp, and then you're going to fill for a pulse in the placenta. As soon as it stops, then you're going to cut it. And then, and then he just dropped it in the waist. Flip it over the leg. Flip it over the leg. So there's your leg. So that's. See if he does breathe. So we should be on page ten seventy. Support the trunk, support the pelvis and lower extremities. Ongoing assessment and care of the mother. Do not forget to continue to assess the care of the mother. That's why it's good to have both of you in the back. Use the primary assessment to identify life threats. Most frequent risk for the mother is bleeding. Provide emotional care. Okay, on 1071, now we're gonna start assessing the neonate. What page is that? I would know this chart for test purposes, and that's the APGAR score. I know there's probably going to be some questions on that, so try to have that memorized. So as soon as the baby's born, you want to do the APGAR score. Um, you want to look for if the patient or the baby is blue or pale. Are the extremities blue, the trunk blue, or are they pink all over? Does everybody see that with the numbers going across? This is what you want to start looking for right when the baby's born. The pulse, do they have one or not? Where's the best place to check for a pulse on a, on a neonate? Use your stethoscope and use the birth or the brachial um, or the umbilical cord. So if you feel a pulse in the umbilical cord, they have a pulse. But the book says the best way, the first way that they recommend is with your stethoscope. Um, grimacing. You want them to be grimacing. Best thing is you want them to be crying. Activity is their body moving, their legs, their arms. Um, no movement is not good. And how can we stimulate the baby? What's the best way and you should be doing? Well, they used to. That's probably what's wrong with us. Or Jim, I mean. So what should you do as soon as that baby comes out? And I handed it. Keep it. Cover, cover it and keep it warm and do it vigorously. So that stimulates the baby. Be careful what you use. Um, if the baby's premature, um, you can tear the skin. So don't be as rough with a preemie because you tear the skin. I see them do that and I'm like, my gosh, is that baby going to survive? I've, I've seen them like vigorously, like warm them up, but that's what they, they need. So they need to be stimulated. Yeah, they are. Boom, towels, clip, done. Boom, here's your babies. Exactly. <laughs> In fact, we've already mailed you the bill. Yeah. And, and uh, C-section is, is different from the normal toddler. Yes. Yes, they'll go in for surgery for the C-section. Okay, so like I said, know your APGAR score. I know that they'll ask questions on that. Um, remember that the newborns rapidly lose heat and because of that, their glucose levels can drop um, and, and it can impact their ability to carry oxygen in their blood. So 
you need that's why they have that cap or now they're wanting some kind of foil cap that they have Space blankets, is that what? Space blankets have a little hood on them that come over them. Kind of so that keeps that heat in there. Do we, Shelly, do they have those in the OR? Do they use those in there? Do they have what? The space blankets, the aluminum foil blankets. No, they actually just use towels, um, like a bath towel to get, okay. to get the babies and wrap them. Okay. Oh, that's right. We don't. Um, just remember to keep the head, wrap the head with something. Um, uh, keep the baby warm. Dry the baby. Discard the wet blankets. Move them to the side and put the dry ones in. Um, I don't know what we have these towels. I don't know what. Um, we have regular towels that we have in the cupboards, but I don't know what size the kit is going to be. So I won't know until we see it. Um, you should know. Towels work really well. That's all yeah. we had on that. Is it? They don't seem like they're real absorbent. They're not, but um, our baby wasn't trying to get fucked out. And so, really right. Okay. Big thing is to try to encourage breastfeeding because that will play into the delivery of the placenta. It causes the veins to constrict. So the best way for to reduce the bleeding of the mother after the baby's born is to get the baby dried off, make sure the airway and everything is good, um, put the baby up to the mother's chest and let her nurse. Um, they like them to be skin to skin. Um, maybe put the baby skin to skin with the mom and then put a blanket over them. So just to kind of entrap that heat. But breastfeeding is the best way to stop the vaginal bleeding after the placenta, or it helps get the placenta delivered. Um, when you're cleaning the baby, try to leave that protective coating, which is called the burnix. That is everybody familiar with what that looks like? You dads that seen that? And don't that's good to leave that on that helps seal the heat in. It's like the stuff that Vienna sausages are Yeah, don't shh now I won't be able to shush. <laughs> um, if bleeding continues after you um, cut the cord, you can put a clamp at the end of the first clamp that you put on. Just clamp again if there's the bleeding doesn't stop. Once you clamp, don't ever unclamp. Uh, like we said, put the end of the cord, try to drape it over the mother's leg. Just try to keep it out of the waist or whatever's underneath her is the goal. Uh, might be a test question. The, pl the placenta should be placed at the same level as the baby or slightly higher. So don't ever let it go below the baby. Why would that matter if you've already cut the cord on that part? Because you have the, you still have the placenta in there. If for some reason you don't get it clamped, Prior to the being delivered, you don't keep it. Or high. Yes, there might be reasons why you don't plant, don't cut it for either. Oh, maybe you don't have stuff to cut it. And then you have it lower and gravity falls, so bleed more. Um. Don't cut the umbilical cord before 30 to 60 seconds. So at least wait that long and then plus wait till the cord stops pulsating. But your book says don't cut it any sooner than 30 to 60 seconds. This is part I talked to Jim about. If you go to 
1074. Wait, that's not it. No, no. Cutting the umbilical cord, if the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck and cannot be slipped over the head, um, we'll go, we'll show you some of that. If attachment impedes resuscitation effort, if attachment interferes with the urgent need for transport of mother or baby, or if protocol requires it. This is all about cutting the umbilical cord. It used to be, um, or you'll have a doctor say, sometimes they don't didn't want the cord cut if you were almost there. So that's why they're go by what your book says and um, whatever, whatever it says is what's going to be on the test. Yeah, most of the time you should be able to get in there and get it loose enough to slip it around the baby's head. But for some reason, if you can't, that's where they're talking about. Um, yeah, we haven't got yeah. there yet because okay. that's one I don't. Okay. I don't agree with that one. Yeah, because the because the baby's going to be hopefully head down. Well, I can't. Yeah. If the baby's head is right here and the cord is around its neck, you're going to want to come in and insert your index finger and a couple other fingers and make a V around the, the nose and try to get that clamp off the, the pressure. So if it's like this, I'm wanting to get under there and get my fingers under that placenta and relieve that pressure off. So best way to do it is so you can rest the baby's head in your hand. So your index finger and a couple of your other fingers. That's the only time you should have any entrance into the vaginal area. And you might have to hold that and be in route. So prepare to be in that position for a long time. If you, if this happens while you're transporting and uh, the main goal is if they're not delivering it is to keep that pressure off the cord from the baby so they can still exchange um, oxygen and nutrients. Be careful when moving the baby so no trauma is brought to the clamped cord. Don't drop the baby. They place the baby on the mother's abdomen, allow her to begin breastfeeding. This is a test question I'm sure um, you'll wanna go 10 inches from the baby and then seven inches and cut in between um, the two clamps. After it stops, what? Why is it so important to stimulate the baby? Keep it warm and get motion, get motion and move them. Exactly. Neonate resuscitation, dry, warm, and stimulate for 30 seconds. If you read your chapter, um, everything that you're going to be assessing is you're going to do it. If you have to re resuscitate, you're going to be doing stuff every 30 seconds. Um, you're going to ventilate for 30 seconds, reassess. So just remember those in intervals. Establish that the baby is breathing. Evaluate respirations, heart rate, and muscle tone, which is in your APGAR. If shallow, slow, gasping, or absent, provide positive pressure ventilation at a rate of 46. And hopefully we, we have PD bags and in there has uh, everything that you would need for a neonate and an infant and a child. So in our rigs, our airway and everything is in our PD bag. So you should have your OB kit and hopefully somebody can grab the PD bag for you. So you'll have your BVM in that bag as well. You'll have everything you need for IVs and stuff and uh, needles and everything. One of the things we're, we're trying to do is put everything we need for an emergency birth in one tote. When you pull that tote out, it's got the emergency birth kit, an extra bulb syringe, yep. the neonate, BVM, and then the emergency birth kit. Now where everything's in one spot, but you got twins, you might have to pull out a second one. So. Right, and they are in the cabinet of the ambulance. We have a cabinet that's airway. So there is another neonate BVM in there. Um, no, you guys should have went over this in your CPR. 
the breaths per minute is 40 to, or ventilations is 40 to 60. And we'll go over that in a minute. Um, if you can't get them to move after you uh, dried and warmed them and are in the process, everything's happening at once. Um, have somebody flick the end of their heel, their foot. We don't hang the babies upside down anymore and spank them because um, I guess they did a study. And once you hang that baby upside down, everything's pushing on the diaphragm. So they had a lot of, that's why they did the study. So we just flick their heels. Assess infant's heart rate. If less than 100 beats, continue positive pressure ventilations. If less than 60, you want to start chest compressions at 90 compressions to 30 ventilations. So you usually go one, two, compressions, one, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. So these I would know for test purposes, plus they're, you should know them already if you got your CPR card. And that is on page 1075. And you need to know this upside down triangle. If, if the patient has adequate respirations and the pulse is greater than 100 beats per minute, everything's good. The baby should be next to the mother and nursing. So. This is what you start out with. You want to dry, warm, and stimulate. Um, if they're not, if their heart rate is under a hundred, you want to start doing positive pressure ventilations, and then you should have ALS if you've had any more problems on the way, which they'll do the advanced airway and the medications. Now, if they'll ask these questions, questions, uh, pertaining to advanced airway and medications on the test, I don't think they would, but I wouldn't put it past them. So just know this triangle. And you, there's no need to hook the, uh, at the end of the BBM, you have a connector that you can put on oxygen. Don't put it on oxygen. They don't need the oxygen. So remember if somebody hands you this BBM and like the firefighters are used to seeing us hook a BBM up to oxygen with adults and stuff, don't hook it up. Um, for neonate. What is a neonate? A, a newborn. Okay. okay. Consider heat loss when resuscitating a neo, neonate. Um, like it said before in prior slides, you're removing wet uh, towels and stuff, and you have something, a covering on their head. So just Remember, you might be doing other stuff. Your partner might be doing other stuff. Um, just keep concerned that you need to keep the baby warm. Is everybody familiar how to do chest compressions on a in neonate? Okay. Yeah. This one shows the where you cradle the torso where your fingers are right in between the nipple line or you can use the two finger method. But with neonates, um, I think they're, they're saying the preferred method is cradling the baby, baby with your hands and the two thumbs on top. Cradle the baby? Well, cradle, cradle the baby with your hands. So you wrap your hands around the chest and you put your thumbs in the middle of the chest and you use your thumbs to do the compression. Around the, uh, their chest area. Chest, yes. yes. Your sternum above the sternum. You have to yeah. right on the sternum. Right on. This is what happens when I have a man do something. Okay, Lewis, I'll show you real quick. I have this simulated baby. So you'll take your hand under there 
and do the same on your other hand. And you'll put your, this is, this is the nipples and you'll want to go in the middle and then you'll just do gently compressions just like that. And do you um, kiss for uh, breathing? Mm -hmm. All at the same time. And then you can check for breathing. I'm going to gently put your hand on here gently so you can feel it. Okay. Yeah. Now you can feel the chest rise and fall so you know he's breathing. Okay. Okay. Well, that's how a baby would react. That's what they're wanting to do if they're wanting you to do if their vitals aren't normal. So that's when you want to start CPR on an infant or neonate. There's so much. So when it says think about it, keep these in mind, because to me, these are like, they're going to ask test questions. So that's why they put this up here. So know what the first steps are in neonatal resuscitation. What is central cyanosis and what is that? Blue. Where at? Lower abdomen. It's your core oh, right here. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that's like they could be breathing fine, but have a and have a heart rate over 100, but they're still blue. Yes. You just continue positive pressure of ventilation. If their central core is pale. And that'll go away. If it's it should working. go away. Okay. What you need to note on neonates, and I didn't know this for a long time, is that when babies are born, their extremities, their hands and feet are pale and they'll stay pale for at least 10 to 15 minutes. So unless they would have told me that, I would have been like, oh my gosh, I got to give you some oxygen and ventilate you. That is normal because that's your extremities. But your core, if it's cyanotic, something's going on. Um, when do we start artificial ven ventilation and what is the rate of artificial ventilation, which the slides show? So I would know these steps for sure. I don't think it says that in your book. It don't have like, think about it. So. It's, mm -mm. It's artificial ventilation is if stimulating worry does not work. Yes, everything's 30 seconds. And that is on where it's a good list to go by and memorize is on page. Um, I need glasses, I don't need my glasses. 1077 that gray table. So that is your steps and what you need to know. Everybody knows the difference between um, giving them uh, oxygen. It, there's a, we don't have a neonate mask, but you can use just a regular, it's called a simple mask um, that you can just hold over the baby's face. So don't ever like put it on there, just hold it above it. Um, and that should help them start to get rid of that purple in their fingers and their toes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you need to, if their respirations, their heart rate is less than 60, then we needed to be doing chest compressions and you need to be ventilating. So and you have neonate BBM. Don't hook this to oxygen. And then for an adult, it's like our BBM is every five seconds for a neonate, like every three. Yes. You'll one, want one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Yeah. So you don't yeah. hold it, you just squeeze it, let it go. As soon as you and be very careful, that's why we have the neonates ones. Um, because you don't want to ventilate too fast. You want to let them at least uh get that breath and watch their chest rise and fall. Because if you see chest rise and fall, you don't need to like squeeze it all the way down. So just watch their chest rise and fall, and that's adequate and the thing with the baby is is the stimulation is that's the most important thing because that's going to kick them to you know their nerves to start to breathe so as you're ventilating still have somebody uh stim be stimulating warming them up Hey, do you guys want to take a, a break after Jessica got up and left? But <laughs> you didn't. You, no, I felt bad when you got up. I should have said, or we can keep going. Whatever you guys want. I do have a quick question about putting the umbilical cord. Okay. So 
when you cut the umbilical cord, there's theoretically, if you do it right, seven inches hanging from the neonate, right? Yes. At what point in time do you shorten that up, or do we not worry about that at all? You don't worry about that. Um, unless it's still bleeding, then you just put another clamp right. on the end of that. Okay. Other than that, you don't worry about that. So part of the reason for that is if once they get to the hospital, they need uh, IV line. They took it in. The they will mm -hmm. cut yes. further down on the umbilical cord. That gives them a fresh area to do it. If you cut it too close to the body, they don't have any more to cut. Give you a fresh entry. And it infection. So that oh, okay. Because it's very vascular. That's like their artery in their veins. So um, not, not that you, if you need to know, there's the artery or the vein is, it's like a your eyes and nose. So your arteries are the eyes and the vein is the mouth. So you have eyes and a mouth. So they usually go for the vein, which is, would be the mouth part of what you see. That's yeah, how I learned. Inches from 10 inches. The first clamp is at 10 inches. And then you put the second clamp seven inches from the baby. And then you want to cut in between the 10 and seven. You want to cut in between those two clamps. So you wait until after there is no, no, no pulse in the umbilical. Correct. Now, suppose you have a uh, umbilical cord is around the, the, the neck, baby's neck, the shoulders. It's, if it's around the shoulders, it's fine. We just don't want it to be around the neck. And if it's, that's right. And if you can't get it off from around the neck, then you're going to put your hands underneath the baby's head and keep the pressure off the umbilical cord. So it can still get nutrients and oxygen from that placenta. The head should come out first. Oh, that's yes. That's a good, that's a good delivery. Yes. Now, suppose the feet. Uh, yeah, we're going to get into that. Delivering the placenta after birth. Um, actually, remember that the woman, it's just as painful to deliver that placenta as some of the labor pains. So keep that in mind. Um, it starts, placenta delivery starts with labor pains. It may take 30 minutes to deliver that. The one I had, um, after I cut the cord, I, the placenta didn't deliver. So just made sure the, to get the placenta, because she was scooted on the, the placenta, her bottom was. So it wasn't coming out. Hopefully you are in transport. With, if everything goes normal, um, you're not having to resuscitate, the baby's doing fine, you should, you have 20 minutes before you have to transport. You have up to 20 minutes. So if everything's going good, just concentrate on getting the baby to breastfeed, keeping it warm. And just a side note, um, per Dr. Engel, the one that I did, um, they like to do a blue coast glucose check if you have time but don't even consider that if everything else is not going right so they like to have that initial blood glucose level for them and then you can uh, prick their heel or their big toe but don't think that oh i gotta check the glucose it's just something that she asked because everything went good with the baby the toe, the toe? The toe or the heel no, that is for what to check their blood sugar. Okay. Oh, okay. After the baby's delivered, like we went over, you want to place a sanitary napkin um, on the outside of the vaginal area. Um, do not place anything inside. Have the mother lower her legs and but not to squeeze them together. Uh, because when she's squeezing, she's contracting and she'll could possibly bleed more. Um, you want to, you can massage the uterus um, to help with contractions if she hasn't delivered the placenta or if she has more bleeding um, than usual. We'll go over that here pretty quick. Encourage the mother to start nursing the baby. 
Um, the blood loss that she, after the delivery is about 500 cc's or 500 mils. It's about two cups of blood that is the normal range for blood loss after the baby. Um, know to, how to massage the uterus. You'll wanna go above the pubis bone and you'll be able to feel something kind of hard like a grapefruit. Um, that's the uterus. So when you find, go above the pubis bone and when you find the grapefruit feeling, just go above that and then you'll just massage in circular, circular motion. Remember that it's, it's um, painful when, they're, when you're massaging because everything is very vascular and it's tender. So if she screams or slaps you, just let her. How long do you do that? Until you get to the hospital or the bleeding is controlled or the placenta is delivered. And you, you do that if there is bleeding? Or if you can do that to, yeah, if there, you can do that to help um, if the mother to discard the placenta or help with the bleeding to stop if there's more bleeding than normal. If there's, if everything is fine, then you don't need to massage the uterus. Think about it, uh, your responsibilities. As soon as that baby is delivered, you tend to take the care towards the infant or the neonate. Make sure you keep an eye on the mother, take their vitals. What's the considered usual loss of blood after the delivery? Which equals how many cc's? Very good. How many cc's? 500. Or two cups. Or two cups. And you men should know what the kindness toward the mother should be already, even before. You should know that from day one of meeting her. So that should be, you should probably not get any of those wrong on the test. Okay. You guys want to break or not? Okay. You good, Lewis? Yes. Okay. All right. Complications of delivery, cord around the neck, the unbroken amniotic, amniotic sac, infants who need encouragement to breathe, which we went over. Breach presentation means what? Feet or butt. Remember that usually if they're breech, more than likely they're going to um, have meconium and aspirate on meconium. Care for the breech presentation. Just keep in mind with the breech, the limbs, they're basically all the same. Initiate rapid transport, put the mother head down with the pelvic elevated, um, O2, if body delivers, support it to prevent explosive delivery as you would in a normal delivery, it's the same thing. Care for baby, the cord, the mother, placenta, just the same as if it was a normal delivery with head first. And I'm sure there's gonna be a test question because they're gonna use that uh, cephalic delivery because they try to throw them Latin words in there and they wanna make sure you know them. A limb presentation, when you see a hand or foot, commonly a foot when the baby is breech, the prolapse cord, um, rapid transport, tra transport, just remember this cannot be delivered in a pre-hospital setting. So if you see any of those, the bottom a limb presentation, you should be driving fast. And we should be on page 1081. We already went over if we couldn't get the cord off around the neck. Okay, Jim, I want to need your help on this one. This is where, let's put the cord. We don't even need to pull that off. 
Okay, if you go to page, let me see, around 1081, transport immediately, mother head down, pelvis elevated, do not pull on the limb, do not replace, push anything back into the uh, birthing canal, do not place gloved hand into the vagina unless there is a prolapse cord, which I showed you would be your index finger and a couple of your other ring finger and your middle finger. Administer oxygen, notify the receiving facility what you got. Um, you should be on the phone with them even with an, a normal delivery. So if you can have a firefighter or your partner, if they're not doing anything at the time, notify the hospital and let them know what's going on so they can prepare for your arrival and they'll already be set to take care of that uh, pregnancy or the baby. What, what is the, the two finger thing again? We're keeping that cord off the, if we can't get the cord off from around the neck, we're going to put our fingers between the baby's neck and the cord and keep that pressure not tight so they can still get oxygen and nutrients from the placenta. Prolapse umbilical cord. If you look at, we're on page 1083. Um, when it presents first and kind of squeeze between vagina wall and baby's head, that's when you're going to use your uh, fingers insertion to the vaginal area. Oxygen supplied to the mother or oxygen can be interrupted. So that's why you want to get that pressure off from around the, the neck. It's a life-threatening condition. The pre-hospital umbilical cord care or prolapse umbilical cord, excuse me. Again, mother position head down, pelvic up, oxygen, check cord for pulses and wrap exposed cord. So this is on 1083. So if you go on to 1083 and where you have the bullets, if you go to the third one down, it says check the cord for pulses and wrap the exposed cord using a sterile towel from the OB kit. The cord must be kept warm. Now, if you go down to the end of the page in 36-23 uh, figure, it says wrap cord in sterile moist towel. So to me, that contraindicated themselves. So we were taught when we first started that the towel or it had to be a moist dressing. So it's saying moist, but up here it's saying just a dry towel or sterile towel. So remember on a test question that it, um, they're recommending a moist towel. Does that make sense? Because it said they didn't reiterate that um, or back and forth. They're saying one thing by saying using a sterile towel. It doesn't say moist there but at the bottom part, it says moist. Confusing, whoever wrote the book. I'm gonna be quiet about that. Same treatment. Um, if the baby's head is not out, and because that's what the prolapsed umbilical cord is, so you have your cord out, and so if it's prolapsed, you want to keep it, wrap it in a moist towel. But as they're saying, you want, there's pressure here with the cord and the perineum. So that's where they're wanting you to keep the pressure off the cord so it can still circulate. We're not gonna do it for one to one forty three. Um, they're wanting to keep that pressure off the cord so you can still get oxygen through there. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on these? Do not attempt to push the cord back in. In fact, do not push anything back in. Patient care, multiple births, same thing, except for if they have twins, the other baby's probably going to be smaller. 
and more than likely you're going to have to uh, resuscitate by giving them oxygen or help them breathe. So be prepared if they have twins, um, be prepared to get set up with your BVM and everything that you would use to resuscitate a baby. Uh, they're going to help you breathe. That's that uh, bag that helps you squeeze and helps get air into the their body. Again, keep baby and mother warm. Keep the airway clear. If you need to resuscitate, know your ventilations and your chest compressions. Watch umbilical cord for bleeding. Avoid contamination. Again, call the emergency department and let them know what's going on. Meconium, patient care, um, same thing. Do not stimulate the infant before suctioning and if you suspect meconium, because if you stimulate them, they're going to breathe that in and they've already aspirated on the meconium amniotic fluid. Again, do you have to resuscitate? You're going to ventilate and do your chest compressions, transport as soon as possible. Support the mother. Emergencies in pregnancy. We're going to go over excessive pre-birth bleeding, etopic pregnancy, seizure, miscarriage, trauma, stillbirth, and cardiac arrest. Placenta previa no, and abruptio placentae. Know the difference between these and know them because these are definite test questions. The placenta previa is the placenta blocks the birthing canal. So inside the birthing canal, your placenta is inside there and it's covering the where the baby can't get out because the placenta is in the way or it's uh, damaged or torn. Remember the placenta is its own organ and it's very vascular. And that is on, yes. Are these cases that the patient needs to be uh, going to the hospital? Yes, sir. Hopefully you're already there. No, I want to try to over my notes. Um, on premature birth, um, remember the second baby may be born either before or after the placenta is delivered. A premature baby is considered less than five and a half pounds. If the mother is unsure of the due date, take her, ask her when her last period was and add 40 weeks to that. So that will kind of give you an idea of where she's at. Hopefully she knows that. Um, abruptio placentae is the placenta prematurely separates from the uterine wall usually caused by trauma. Complete abruptio, abruption causes massive hemorrhage and is usually fatal for the fetus. And like I said, it's very important to know like if they've been in a car wreck or any kind of trauma, if that placenta is on the wall of the uterus and it just has just a, a small tear, it can start getting bigger. So that's why um, they'll have, this could happen. So their blood's getting in between the placenta in the wall of the uterus and slowly tearing away. So once that tears away and it's not supposed to be torn or come out, that's major bleeding. She should be in, a, in the hospital. So very life-threatening. So you've already had your shock class, gone over shock. So you do the same thing with pregnant in, in this situation. You treat for shock. Um, so on that one. Like if you see more than 500 cc's or two cups of blood, um, you're going to treat for shock. 
Um, I was told one time placenta pre previa and abruptio placenta <clears throat> is one of them had abdominal pain and the other one didn't. They both can have abdominal pain. So keep that in mind. Abdominal Your abdominal pain. pain. So if you know they're pregnant and you know they're bleeding when they're not supposed to or bleeding more, um, just uh, know that it could be the placenta previa or abruptio placentae. This could be 12 before birth. Yes. This presents. Yes. Is it normal for a water break? Yes. That's when, the, you know, you'll, the woman will say, oh, I felt my water break. And there's usually about, I think, a quart of fluid <coughs> in your amniotic sac. When we are preventing severe bleeding, we place us um, like a pad, sanitary napkin. Yes. You probably do not want to put pressure. No. On that area. No. As you would a normal bleed. Exactly. But obviously. Yeah, because you you'll let that, because if you put pressure on it, you're just pushing it in to the vaginal area. So and they don't want anything in because keep in mind the infection part of that is going to the baby as well. So we're just trying to catch all the blood and stuff that's draining out. Right. And then paramedics are probably like, if it's severe enough, giving blood at that point. The, the doctor will give blood. Um, medics will more than likely be transporting and they'll hang the blood and then we'll go to the closest facility you guys or we'll can, fly. You guys can give blood on ambulance. We can yeah. monitor it but and we can turn it off, but we can't start it. Oh. So it has to be started by a nurse. It's best to prepare uh, as best as you can for childbirth in case of some um, complication. Always be prepared for anything in a childbirth. Hopefully it's a normal delivery, but always be prepared um, for these things that can happen. Any questions? Know these for sure. Pre-birth bleeding, main sign is profuse bleeding. Abdominal pain may or may not be felt. Assess for signs of shock, give oxygen, place a sanitary napkin over the bat vagina, save mm -hmm. all tissue that is passed. Oh, just put it in this tub. Um, if you're on with the ambulance, I think our Kit's going to have this tub with the lid. Or put that in a plastic bag. You want your tub to be safe for the placenta. You don't mix the placenta in with all your waste. Like we said from the beginning, be alert for an ectopic pregnancy. Um, acute abdominal pain is on, usually on one side. Vaginal bleeding. If you have a rapid and weak pulse and low blood pressure, those are late signs, especially the low blood pressure. That's a very late sign. That means they should probably be in the OR by now. Um, and they haven't had a menstrual period. A lot of uh, women are pregnant and they don't know it. And they think that the abdominal pain is the beginning of their cramps for their period. So that can be uh, confusing. So it's important to ask, when was your last period? Are you regular? Is it normal not to have a period every month? Because some women don't. Um, try to get as much history as you can for any type of abdominal pain, um, vaginal bleeding, or if they haven't had a, a period. So get as much history as you can from the mom or somebody that could be pregnant. This is life-threatening. How can a woman know that she's not pregnant? There, it happens. Some women don't, they go all the way up to delivering the baby and not knowing they're pregnant. And they will be in the shower or be going to the bathroom and deliver a baby. I'm like, hello. This is a big one. Remember, there'll be questions on preeclampsia versus eclampsia. Oops. Um, that, this is when the high or the blood pressure spikes really high, and that's usually when women are told that they need to stay in bed and try to stay off their feet. Know the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. Um, 
what you'll see in the mother face is going to be swollen. Um, her legs and ankles are going to be swollen, which they already are when she's pregnant. But when they're hypertensive or high blood pressure, they're going to even have more swelling in their legs and their face. The normal uh, time for uh, for a uh, menstrual period is how often? Every 28 days. Every 28 days? Yes, sir. If, if it doesn't occur within that period of time, it's possible that the lady is pregnant? Yes, if she's had uh, sexual intercourse with somebody. So if she's sexually active and she doesn't have doesn't have her period once a month, then she should probably um, get a pregnancy test or go in and see a physician. Once a month, every month. Yeah, every month the woman has a period. But some of them don't have a period every month. They they're not regular. Some women aren't regular. Uh, why is that being reported? It could be something to do with their hormones. Um, their estrogen and progesterone levels aren't normal. It could be many things. Okay, we should be on page 1090 with the seizures in pregnancy. One, preeclampsia is when um, they want you to stay off your feet because your blood pressure can get high. Eclampsia is when the blood pressure has gotten high. Know the difference between those two because that's a test question, probably. Eclampsia is when your birth blood pressure is high. Is when it does does get elevated. Preeclampsia is it could they want you to stop, stay off your feet or be take check your blood pressure more and make sure it doesn't get elevated. But if it does elevate or get high, then it becomes eclampsia. Now, miscarriage and abortion. Um, don't use the word abortion if they're having a, if you suspect a miscarriage, because women relate abortion to um, getting rid of the baby on their own, on, on purpose. So don't ever use the word abortion. Um, they'll have cramping and abdominal pain, bleeding, uh, ranging from moderate to severe. Going to have obviously blood from the vaginal area. Once again, you're always wanting to take vital signs, check, for, look for shock symptoms, uh, place sanitary napkins over vaginal opening, transport as soon as possible, save all the blood soaked pads and the tissue because the doctor or um, they'll want to send that to the lab and provide emotional support. Trauma in pregnancy, pregnant patients pulse is usually 10 to 15 beats um, faster than non-pregnant. Remember we have about 48, the female has about 48% of more blood or yes, more blood. And if they lose 30 to 35%, that's um, you need to start checking or treating for shock. That is in the book with the 48%. So know that. That would be on page 1091. Did they, did they lose uh, more than 28% of their blood? No, their blood volume is 48%. They're just doing the blood percentage of what it could be more for a woman. And so if they lose 30 to 35%, they should, it's to be life-threatening. 30, 30 to 35% of blood. Yes. Trauma, we went over this. Um, you'll treat for shock if they're in shock. Stillbirth, um, you'll know, the mother will know she might, or she might know that she might not be feeling any movement with the baby throughout the day. So um, she might already know that something's going on. Uh, coach her to have the baby. Go ahead and, and if, if it's imminent that she's going to have the baby, just deliver the baby like you would a normal baby. Um, you'll know when they're stillborn because they'll have like um, 
uh, blisters all over their body filled with water they're it's obvious um very blue you'll you'll know if the baby's dead or not or if you um need to resuscitate it um be there for emotional support if the baby is stillborn clean the baby up ask the them if she wants to hold it or still keep her in the loop of what's going on because that is a, a death for them so make sure that uh you give them the support that they need and ask them what they want and try to answer some questions if they have any. Um, still transport them because the mother you just need to have them looked at and this needs to be something that a doctor needs to talk to them about and look at her and observe her and everything. So still transport, still um, be there emotionally and just um, take care of the the fetus or the baby wrap it up and like I said if she wants to hold it ask her if she wants to hold it or the father cardiac arrest in pregnant women same thing as with they're not pregnant um, except for if they're over 20 weeks you'll want to take the abdomen and use both hands and move the, the try to move the abdomen over to the left side so that's give, given better perfusion when you're doing CPR. Vaginal bleeding, um, treat it life-threatening, check for associated abdominal pain, monitor for shock, especially hypovolemic shock. Trauma to external genitalia. This might be hard uh, in case they've been sexually um, raped or something tra traumatic has happened try to get the uh talk to the female without anybody around she'll answer more questions maybe um always consider consider um, additional internal injuries do not disturb the crime scene these are going to be test questions on this one i remember um, examine the genitals if there's severe bleeding present. And the one thing mm -hmm. that you always need to keep in mind is the, mod the modesty of the, the female. If you have no females on, make sure there's somebody in there with you, your partner. But um, if you have to examine the vaginal area for bleeding, and I would only do that if you think it's life-threatening. If, if not, just transport, treat for shock, and let um, the ER do it because they have nurses that are certified. It's called SANE. I can't remember sexually assault. Mm -hmm. it's, I, it's a kit that they have to use, a certain kit that they have to use to do um, a pelvic scope or pelvic uh, thing on them too. So that's totally separate. So try to get as much information as you can. Um, she'll want to try to probably take a shower or rinse off don't let her take a shower explain to her that it's important that this is going to be needed for the law enforcement so she's going to be pretty upset so keep that in mind so that is for uh, any uh, abuse any kind of sexual abuse or yeah sexual abuse trauma can be Anything can happen to the same, just depends on what it is. You can still be hurt on your genital area. Oh, on the, still born is, does it come from uh, uh, incident or? It can be, it can be many things. There could be something wrong with the baby or it can be usually when the baby is in the process of being labor starts, it's, like a shock factor for them. I mean, they're in shock as well. So it could be that they went into cardiac arrest while they were getting ready to be born. It could be many things. Be uh, something that they had wrong with them or be many things. And the other one that you mentioned about uh, concerning abortion, not um, 
because they they miscarriage they'll say with with the miscarriage they'll say a spontaneous abortion so when a lady is miscarrying it could be rapid which is spontaneous and they medically they term it as spontaneous abortion. But women, or we all can relate abortion to when you go terminate your pregnancy on your own. So women don't like, don't say you're aborting your baby or just do emotional care and just treat for the bleeding. Uh, a miscarriage can come from uh, an incident? Yes, yeah, trauma or something's wrong with the embryo, the fetus. So it's not uh, on purpose? No, not on purpose, no. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we're gonna need to take a break and then um, come back. And then we're going to go over this. I'll have somebody deliver this baby. Sweet. I'll let Jim pick who wants to do that. Yeah. I'm 30 minutes late, Cody. Sorry. I use Jones right now. I hope you don't mind the questions. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> interesting about growing up. <laughs> well, I'm going to go get something set up for our scenario, okay? Okay. And then, uh, where are those clamps? I let, uh, for, uh, I'll show you when I get my scenario ready. Okay. All right. I'll Do you want to go to the restroom? Yes. Uh, I do
Damn. You were the sole reason they got him. Yeah. So your big guy. I think about that all the time. Like, Tanner's metabolism is amazing. Uh, I also do a lot. Like, a lot. Like, today I had three ladders for an hour. So all I did for an hour straight until we showed up. So we got myself. Is that like three so years? Well, well, I messaged you yesterday, too, because I know that you were the one that actually picked up. So. Yeah. I heard. And I don't, I know you had missed the one of the Sundays. Hey, Shelly, can you still hear? Can you still hear us? Yeah, I can still hear. Can you see on the, can you see our camera? Yes. You can see this? I can, I see the, um, just a uh, screen, like a, all right. All right. Trying to figure out my screens here. For some reason I don't have. Thank you. 